Well, welcome everyone. Delighted to have you this evening joining us for this AONM webinar. And um, of course, wonderful to have Dr. Armin Schwarzbach with us again. I'll just um, introduce him briefly. Let me just, in terms of housekeeping, mention that if you have any questions um, in the course of the webinar, please just pop them into the chat or the Q&A and we'll cover as many as we can afterwards. Armin will be speaking for about 45 minutes. He has got quite a long presentation today, but as you know, he speeds through uh, presentations at a rate of knots. Um, I'll just briefly introduce him. Um, it's uh, from detection to treatment today, exploring viral testing, reactivation and therapy. And um, Dr. Armin Schwarzbach is a world expert in the field of laboratory medicine and infectious disease. And um, he's particularly committed to the field of Borrelia burgdorferi and co-infections, a research area to which he's devoted more than 20 years of his professional life. He has um, conducted, uh, including all the SARS-CoV testing he did over the pandemic, well over half a million samples from tests from patients. And so I think we'll just let Armin fire away um, Delighted to have you, Armin. Thank you. And um, we'll talk to you again at the end uh, with our questions. I'll leave now. Thank you. Thank you, Jillian, for this very kind introduction. Um, yes, um, Corona is um, over now, and but we have still the viruses, let me say. So um, I will talk about uh, the detection to the treatment, um, how we can explore the viral testing, the reactivation, or we name it opportunistic, the opportunism and therapy options. This is really a newer chapter we opened up. Uh, you will see later on. Very important is um, if you do a diagnostic test, ask your laboratory if it has accreditation. And um, yeah, I could proudly say we have the CAP accreditation, the Clinical American Pathologist, which is international accreditation. Additionally, so um, the quality of the test should be a good one and um, not a bad one. So to compare all of the results you are doing in your laboratory. Um, three eyes in diagnostics and therapies. Um, this is now also so the um, way of CDC in America. Um, we know that infections play a role. We know that uh, inflammation plays a role and the immune dysfunction, immune suppression, and all three belong together. So if you have an infection, you always have infection and immune dysfunction. If you have immune dysfunction, you will get reactivated infections and you will get inflammation. If you have inflammation, the same will happen with the immune system and the infections get reactivated. So this is cycling around and this is very important also in uh, doing therapies with your therapist. Um, the agenda today is uh, the recent research, um, a huge viral involvement, uh, reactivation in the post-COVID era, um, optimal testing for DNA and RNA viruses. And um, I also want to talk about therapeutic options for viral infections, um, infection, inflammation, immune dysfunction, and also about detoxification, which options we have nowadays doing that. Um, the prevalence of herpes infection and the reactivation in this um, is now fully recognized. Um, that started um, in the beginning, let's say 2020, 2021, uh, because in intensive care, they had a lot of problems with reactivations of viruses. And a lot of papers came and we have now this meta-analysis and the prevalence of active EBV infection in COVID-19 population um, is around 41%, which is a lot. Um, in multiple sclerosis, we know it's around 66%, so much higher. But EBV, it's a virus of the herpes virus group, um, plays a very important role. Um, a little bit lower in this meta-analysis was the prevalence um, of activated HHV6, 34%. In the third place, the prevalence of activated herpes simplex virus one. Um, this might be a herpes on the lips or <clears throat> genital herpes, 
28 percent, followed by cytomegalovirus and the varicella zoster virus. Uh, you all know the herpes zoster as so the activation as example. And in this Banco meta-analysis, again, EBV is the most prominent reactivation. Um, the mechanisms now also becoming more and more clear. There's a lot of research about that. In the study 2021, that was the first study about that with the long-term COVID patients. They found two-thirds of them. It was a pilot study <clears throat> were positive for EBV reactivation. Um, we all have thought that uh, everybody has this virus in the body, but um, it doesn't play any role. So if you talk with virologists, they say to you, yes, everybody ha had this virus. But this is not the question. The question is, is this virus reactivated or not? We all know that from the HRV model from the 80s, um, where we learned about how viruses which persist in us can be reactivated. And this is now the chapter which was opened by this SARS-CoV-2 virus. Hashimoto in 2023, he found that the mechanism by EBV stored in memory B cells and the EBNA, the EPNA, um, also can be reactivated by SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, this is just a model, please. Um, let us think about also other infections. Uh, you know, I, I'm coming from Lyme disease for 20 years or 25 years now, and also other infections can reactivate other infections. You know, so uh, we see that also in uh, Lyme disease patients, a massive reactivation of viruses. So various phenomena contribute to EBV reactivation in COVID. Um, so EBV can be reactivated as I have shown by a SARS-CoV-2 infection, or it can be exacerbated by SARS-CoV-2, could get worse if it's uh, ongoing process, and then you get another virus which suppresses your immune system. And again, um, the susceptibility. So if you have an underlying EBV infection, you have ME and you don't know that EBV is doing that, or you have multiple scores and you don't know EBV virus is doing that. Um, also, you have a higher susceptibility for COVID infection. So your immune system is suppressed. You see the three cells. You helper cells are suppressed. Um, this is pretty clear all the, of this immunology behind that. And the immune suppression plays really a huge role. Um, there are a lot of studies now, the interaction between SARS-CoV-2 and EBV decrease also of the CD cells is uh, written in some paper works, not just CD4 cells, and the natural killer cells. And you know that we had been a lot of CD56, CD57 cells, and exactly this is what we see, a massive reduction of the general natural killer cells. This is the marker, is a CD56 count. And also, we know that a lot of patients are treated with immune suppressive drugs like uh, corticosteroids. And you know, they work anti-inflammatory, corticosteroids are inflammatory for a while, but um, if you use them longer in higher dosages, um, you suppress your immune system. And that means you induce by this drug a risk factor for reactivation of some viruses like herpes viruses. There's also an increasing correlation of HHV6, human herpes virus 6, and even HHV7, the herpes human virus 7, and HHV8 with neurological manifestations. And cytomegalovirus plays a very important role in this. Um, we always thinking about EBV, the Epstein-Barr virus, but we forgot about the cytomegalovirus. And, um, what we see in laboratory um, statistics, so we have more and more problems with the cytomegalovirus, or we have together with EBV, the Epstein-Barr virus. And in this study, 2021, um, they found a prevalence of herpes viruses uh, nearly around 80% um, for one of these herpes viruses. But also for 75% uh, of these patients have also co-infection with two or more viral subtypes. So that means what we see daily in the laboratory results that it's not just one virus active. We find patients up to five, six viruses active. Um, but we have the patients just with one virus active. We have uh, two 
or three. So it's individual profile, um, which depends on your history. Uh, so that means which virus you had a contact during childhood or when you uh, get contaminated with the virus, infected with the virus. Not everybody has every virus um, during the whole life acquired. And HHV6 um, is also prevalent in these uh, studies, 47% cytomegalovirus, again, 43%. And HHV7, 39%, and HHV8. I had an accreditation of the German accreditation authorities, and Professor Schnitzler from University Heidelberg came to me and he said, Oh no, it, it cannot be reactivated. Uh, in our guidelines for virologists, HHV6, 7, 8 cannot be reactivated. And I said to him, Oh, I have different papers now, but they these are not in your guidelines. Uh, how old are your guidelines? He said, from 2016. Okay, uh, old guidelines, you need to update this. And I show him now that HHV 6, 7, and 8 can be reactivated in normal people, not just in very fresh infections. You know, this is now a challenge for the virologist. Cytomegalovirus also influences the coagulation system. All of these viruses can influence the coagulation system. There's a lot of proof. This article is very old, nearly 20 years old, so we know that for a long while, um, but um, the coagulation experts, they don't know that. Um, this is also, they need to learn about that because inflammation um, is in the, also in the bloodstream, the infected white blood cells with the cytokines you see on the left side interleukin 1 interleukin 6 on the th2 side but it's also a um, change of the environment from anticoagulant to procoagulant so uh, you have the clotting clotting is the word and you know there are a lot of clinics now offering inosarases or the best version is the help aphrasis, H-E-L-L-P. Um, so that can help you temporarily also in this coagulation if you're infected and you have cold hands, cold fingers, uh, a bad blood perfusion, the erythrocytes have a problem, your oxygen has a problem. Then it's also, I think you can think about uh, doing some aphrasis and uh, temporarily to help your perfusion, but it will not solve the virus story. Um, there's an association of agents HV6 and HV7, as I mentioned, with the EBV, the Epstein Barr virus, in myalgic encephalomyelitis, but also PAR virus B19. Um, Professor Leonor Gilbert is not here, but uh, maybe she's listening. Uh, I know that Leona did a wonderful work in your vascular university with PAR virus B19. And I said to her years ago, Leonor, I, I don't believe that it plays a role, but now we know that it plays a role also in infected, uh, in reactivations in infected uh, COVID uh, patients. Um, and also patients with ME. HHV6 are lymphotropic, neurotropic, and immunomodulating viruses. Um, and they persist your whole life. Um, the question is, do you want us to remove that or be arranged with that or should we keep them under control? I think the last aspect will be the solution. Um, I, I don't believe that you can eliminate all of the viruses and uh, this is really impossible because they can hide, they go into the lymphatic system. <clears throat> we come later to that. Um, and the reactivation that um, can also doing a lot of illnesses involving the immune system, the central nervous system, and also trigger ME and chronic fatigue. And there's a high rate of these viruses, HHV6, 7, and uh, PARVO virus B19, um, with the pro-inflammatory cytokine levels, and also with the active uh, viral infections. And uh, this shows clearly in this paper also the necessity um, doing more studies for identification of other other viruses um, in ME patients, which is, um, you know, the main problem also of uh, long COVID. So, uh, I know that we are uh, not allowed to talk so much about now. It's more open mind about post vac patients or both. Um, here to SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, the ability of RNA viruses to persist in tissues for long periods was largely ignored. Um, now um, it's um, in in a in a PLOS uh, pathogens article. Um, they said that the enteroviruses um, involvement plays a 
very important role in ME and the chronic fatigue group also. Um, the question is, uh, do the hidden reservoirs harbor these viruses? Have they induced autoimmunity through molecular mimicry? We know that from Lyme disease. Lyme disease can all, or Borrelia, Bogdorferi, the pathogen can also do uh, mimicking, but a lot of these viruses can do mimicking and induce autoimmune disorders. So if you treat the virus, you have a good chance um, to get uh, to reduce the titers and to get rid of maybe Hashimoto's or Schürgren syndrome or rheumatoid arthritis. We know that uh, also from Lyme disease, if we treat with antibiotics, that some of the patients um, we could uh, reduce the ANA titer as an example. Um, the pathogenesis of enteroviruses. Um, there's a primary um, entrance uh, by aerosol or ingestion. It's um, high, highly contagious to you. So um, it's like sneezing and then you inhale it and then there's a replication in the tonsils and also the payas patches. And this is a are the gut viruses, the enteroviruses. We have three different groups. One is the Coxsackie virus group. The second is the poliomyelitis virus group, where, we, where you could do vaccination against that. And the third group is the echovirus group. And they have a lot of subspecies, subtypes. Um, the problem is that um, they persist in the payas patches and they persist also in the uh, tonsils or in, in our mouth and they can be reactivated. Um, the, pro the next problem is the macrophages they transport these viruses, uh, which originally are gut viruses, um, all over the body. Um, they pass the, uh, into spinal fluid. That's not a problem. They inflame the brain. The, uh, you can get a meningitis. You can get a liver problem, a skin problem, a muscle problem, myocarditis. Uh, it mimics a lot of other infections for sure. But the original problem is or was the gut. And this is what we see in many, many patients, um, the herb angina, which is a react, means a reactivation in the mouth of this Coxsackie virus. And um, if you have this, um, you should check yourself for Coxsackie virus infection. This is a slide I did as an overview um, uh, from scientific papers. Um, it's a cellular virus. Um, it's a single-stranded RNA virus. It's highly contagious. It can easily spread from person to person. Person, fecal, oral, if you go on restrooms, it's in the kindergarten, it's in your household, you can get reinfections with other subtypes, uh, droplets of fluid from sneezes, coughs, body fluids, and so on. Um, it's a gastrointestinal virus, um, and it has two main groups, group A, group B, and you all can see all of these problems, uh, as it is a sore throat, it's very common uh, symptom of this uh, Coxsackie virus, diarrhea, um, cough, fatigue, uh, conjunctivitis, loss of appetite, headache, night sweats, um, so, uh, but also very traumatic uh, developments uh, if you get uh, insulin-dependent diabetes myelitis, also described in huge studies, the myositis, uh, paralysis, so it's um, highly neurotropic virus and uh, it can also inflame and destroy parts of uh, your brain as an example. Um, also the frontotemporal dementia, you know, Bruce Willis, um, I don't want to say that he is suffering from that, but we know that Coxsackie virus can do that. Um, the myalgic encephalomyelitis is one of the main complications, the mitochondrial pathies in this. So you feel fatigued for sure. The colitis, all of this colitis group has a massive problem with this gut viruses, leaky gut, you name it, food intolerances, histamine intolerances, um, um, issues you could get with this Coxsackie virus and the echo virus. Um, Dr. Amy Prohl is very uh, exciting doing research um, with the PSAC. And what she mentioned, it's very brand new research. Um, um, she's doing more and more in that since 2021. Um, she uh, described a lot of viruses connected um, with uh, infected patients with COVID-19. Um, SARS-CoV-2, she did a lot of studies, enteroviruses, uh, Coxsackie, echo the Ebola virus, the Zika virus, the dengue fever virus, 
measles influenza, but also Borrelia. She did research on that. Borrelia, Bartonella, Babesia, Coxilla, the Q fever, Brucella, the retroviruses, um, DNA viruses, EBV, human herpes virus 6, 7. The, the list is not complete, so we have some other viruses, as I mentioned already. Uh, but in uh, this uh, study and the, the, the good papers she did uh, the last years, um, she said that the study of this SARS-CoV-2 reservoir um, in PSHC may inform the identification of disease mechanisms, biomarkers, and therapeutics for other chronic conditions increasingly tied to persistent viral infection. So it's now accepted that viruses can persist or can be reactivated, um, which is really now uh, completely changing the whole medical world um, uh, in, in the pathogens. These diseases, um, she also um, tells the story of my ME, uh, Alzheimer's diseases, mentioned autoimmune diseases, such as multiple sclerosis, uh, which is more or less a autoimmune disease and systemic lupus. So um, how can you diagnose persistence of the spike protein? And uh, this was, uh, is a question, but we can do that very well now. We check for SARS-CoV-2 IgA antibodies. And I'm really shocked how many patients we diagnose with massively elevated IgA spike protein antibodies. Um, and um, this spike antigen, as you know, it's still an immunogen, um, which weakens your immune system. It, it's uh, it's doing you inflammation, you coagulopathies, you have problems with it. So it's not good to have IgA antibodies, believe me. Um, you could have them for a while, for maybe two, three, four weeks, but that's a maximum. But what we see now, it's massively elevated in patients with, uh, let me say, also post-vac and also long COVID, post-COVID uh, patients. So they still have this SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, and we can detect that with the IgA, which is mucosal um, antibody. Um, there's also a shocking conclusion of some researchers from large uh, scale studies. Um, they, they said, meanwhile, not to threaten you. It's a brand new study from uh, end of February uh, this year. Um, long COVID does not seem to be self dissolving. It, it's a study from a, nearly 1 million adults and um, the transmission in England. And they said there's um, a three point loss in IQ, which is not so good. Um, the possible mechanisms are now discussed that studies involving humans and mouse or genoids uh, show that SARS CoV 2 infection induces fusion in neurons, which compromise neural, neural activities. Um, and it seems like long COVID does not seem to be self resolving in the sense of recovery. But but, 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 but if you suffer, as an example, from a reactivation of a virus doing um, your symptoms, then you have options, okay? Uh, I, I'm not pretty sure that these researchers are um, pretty in, well informed about uh, what, I'm what I talked about, uh, some of these papers, um, but um, I, I think that plays a very important role also that you have options and you that you could recover from long COVID. Um, the optimal testing for DNA and RNA viruses, as you know, um, the cytomegalovirus, um, we have an IgG and IgM test. The IgA test is uh, not accredited. Um, it's more or less an in-house test. So uh, we have an Ig for varicella zoster virus and for herpes simplex virus, but for cytomegalovirus and uh, Epstein-Barr virus, it's not a test um, which you should rely on and uh, say this is now my activity marker. Um, the IgG um, is it's really problematic in this if you don't have an IgA test. The IgM it doesn't help you really. It's more important to do an IgA test for sure. IgG means past infection. There's no discussion with IgM, but uh, the information is missing. The IgA, what is about the IgA for cytomegalovirus, but we don't have a good test. Um, the same with the uh, Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, but in this case, we have the early antigen, and a lot of these studies are based on the 
the A, the early antigen. So ask your laboratory, are you doing the early antigen or not? If they don't do the early antigen, um, the test um, is not conclusive for you and uh, you cannot say it's now uh, excluded my reactivation. Um, this is how the reports are looking like. Uh, this is, we see daily so many patients, um, I cannot tell you, um, also patients who think they have Lyme disease, but that maybe they had Lyme disease, but they had reactivations uh, of all of these viruses. Um, and uh, varicella sostra, important role, the IgA is elevated in this case for Kokosaki virus, uh, infection, um, also echovirus is elevated, IgA titer, um, and SARS-CoV-2. This is what I already have spoken about, that the IgA, this is not normal, um, this is not allowed. And this is a sign that the spike protein is still working on the mucosa, it's still active. Uh, maybe also the virus could persist, you know, we have also now studies that the virus could persist. Um, what can we do for cyanobacteria? What can we do also to uh, improve the diagnostics because we don't have IgA? Um, we are doing a lot of these T cell tests, you know that, and one is named the Elispot test, an enzyme-linked immunosorbent spot, which is CAP accredited. So there's no discussion about that for the viruses. It's German accreditation, which implicates the UCAS accreditation. So we are threefold accredited. Meanwhile, in the national, there's no discussion on the results, um, and. And I think in Germany, um, there are more labs doing these tests now. And I think we, we have a good experience with that test. And we are the leading labs in the world uh, doing most of these tests internationally. Um, in many countries, they don't know this test or they ignore it uh, or they say they don't exist. It's a kind of release essay, Interfront Gamma release essay, it's named. And I could proudly present you a new book where we did a chapter with uh, my infectious disease expert on my side, Dr. Putiana is a parasitologist, fantastic parasitologist, uh, and Markus Berger. And <clears throat> we did this uh, new book with uh, her, her co-authored uh, Leona Gilbert. Uh, she's the editor of that. Um, it's published now, evidence-based book with a lot of good tests. And if you want to understand more about that, uh, buy the book. It's not so cheap to buy, um, but uh, we say that in, the, in our chapter that many clinical laboratories are convinced that the cellular test is superior to the Western blood assay in terms of sensitivity sensitivity for de detecting the underlying Borrelia infection. There's a book about Borrelia burgdorferi, but you can transpose it to all infections, I would say. This is how our spot. We have now the solution for EBV infection. You could see here the lytic antigen. These, the papers are based on early antigen and the lytic antigen. And you can see here the latent phase, so the sleeping virus, which is allowed to have that, the snoring form, but it's lytic means replication. This is not good. Uh, it's really a high um, lymphocytic interferon gamma release, and you have really um, a problem with this virus for sure. And the, all of these patients, they suffer from chronic fatigue, what I can tell you. Um, and we need to bring back the lytic phase into the latent phase, the latency. And if we can manage that, we have the virus under control. So we have a perfect marker by this test, believe me. This is we see daily and we see also in the follow up uh, how the patients are improving. Um, we developed, as you, uh, you know me, maybe I'm a clinician, also medical doctor, infectious disease doctor, internal medicine. I did a lot of uh, uh, infections during my career. Oncology I did in hospitals. <clears throat> so I know all about the symptomatology, about the differentials. And what we developed um, in the beginning of uh, SARS-CoV-2 in 2020, it was already, I said, yeah, we need to check for opportunistic infections. And it's pretty clear that the patients will get this by this massive uh, SARS-CoV-2 to um, epidemic. So, and this is how it works. And um, it's free of any cost. You could download from the website and uh, post COVID also, let me name it inofficially post VEC or both in combination checklist. And um, we are also very busy. We have now parasite checklists. We have also checklists for rheumatoid arthritis um, patients. Um, we have a um, viral reactivation panel developed together. Uh, I think it's an affordable price. I don't want to, to do much marketing on this. It's not necessary. Um, but uh, I want to say we also have the main um, pathogens, the main viruses in a panel for you, uh, where you can find out if it 
if the virus is active in your body, but just if you have symptoms, please, uh, if you don't have any symptoms, it doesn't make sense to test you. Okay, spare the money. But if you have symptoms and you can use the checklist, you can use also the new uh, Army Labs viral checklist um, for download. Um, we can tell you more about this uh, chapter. And there are a lot of links um, to more detailed virus presentations on the AONM website. Uh, look, we started in 2019 already with the virus story. It was one year before COVID, Corona came. So we were on the right track already. And so we have a lot of experience for five years now with these viruses, how to diagnose and also um, how to treat them. And um, in the beginning, all the doctors, they said, we cannot treat the virus. We cannot treat the virus. I said, we need to treat the virus. It's, it's nonsense. Um, so um, during my career, I also um, was infected myself with the Coxsackie virus. And uh, I, I'm my own patient. So I know something about these herbs. And um, I'm a fan not of the chemical drugs. I, I don't like the virus statics, which you can try out, um, but they are virus statics for sure. Uh, but on the other side, they have side effects. They can be liver toxic, nephrotoxic. Um, the Samento. Samento is one of the herbs we have in the world. Um, uh, and this is really good working against herpes simplex virus type one, and it has a good antiviral um, capacity. Um, and it plays an important role uh, if um, doctors work with the herbs in fighting against uh, pathogens that cause the infections. Um, so um, it helps you uh, in improving symptoms, also like the osteoarthritis. Um, so if you have osteoarthritis, I'm sure you have also an underlying infection, which is maybe treated with Samento. And maybe you know the name Eva Thapi. She did studies in Lyme disease, I think 10 or 15 years ago, and it was very successful treatment with Samento and the combination with Banderol. Bundrol is also from the Amazon basin, and it's a broad-spectrum antimicrobial. Um, it's very effective, as I mentioned, against Borrelia burgdorferi and the co-infections. Um, you know, Bartonella, Babesia. Interestingly, it can help also against Aspergillus and Chlamydia, which is one of the main uh, bacterial pathogens we see reactivated also along COVID patients. Interestingly, it has also antiviral properties. Um, there's a book about that, also from Stephen Puner. And if you're interested, there's also a lot of evidence-based paperwork behind it, or you Google, and it can be, or it is effective, better to say it can be effective against cytomegalovirus, some encephalitis viruses, hepatitis virus, and the human papilloma virus. So if you have a problem with human papilloma virus, you also could try it out. You cannot lose anything. Um, it's it's not a risk for you because um, it's, it belongs to nutritional medicine. Um, it can also address mycoplasma, some parasites, rickettsia, coxella, alicia. Um, it's prostatitis, also very interesting to use it in respiratory infections, but I'm sure there's also chlamydia mycoplasma behind that. Um, the sinusitis, asthma, atherosclerotic, disease, um, cellulitis, psoriasis, and urinary tract infections. Um, so we have a lot of options there to try it out. Um, I would not longer try it out than two months. Uh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You need to change your strategy. Um, I'm more the fan of the liquids than I'm fan of the capsules. And um, my wife is a naturopathic doctor. Um, and in Germany, they work, um, they like to work with the liquids to say not with the capsules. Uh, it's traditional way to work here in Germany in the naturopathic way. Um, also the Takuna. Takuna, um, I think it's a newer herb uh, against the viruses in the combination with Hotunia. Um, it came, uh, it became, it it became famous, I think, also eight, nine, ten years ago. And we know that it works against HHV, herpes simplex virus type 1 and 2, but also cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, um, and uh, viral encephalitis, meningitis. And um, I'm taking that myself prophylactically, and I, I, I'm not getting so many uh, colds. <laughs> it's interestingly so... I'm using it for years, the Takuna and Totunia. These are my favorite herbs in the world. Um, so also, Stephen, it's not in Stephen Puna's book because it's too new. 
Tria. This is the herb which is known all over the world. Um, we have it um, also studies um, against norovirus, herpes simplex virus one, influenza, and other viruses. Um, Hotunia, you find a lot of paperwork, a lot of information about that uh, scientific. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, published papers about. Kumanda, also a herb uh, to, uh, to treat infections. It's antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, antiparasitic, anti inflammatory. Um, um, maybe to say, we cannot say these herbs are just specific for this infection. My impression is sometimes of most species works against bacteria, maybe against parasites and also against viruses. But in the end, um, the combination makes it stronger. So you, if, if you do a combination with Tacuna and Otunia and Comanda maybe and um, uh, yeah, Stevia, I come to that um, in the over next slide, um, you have a better synergistic situation to cover all or in a broad range. If you don't know, if you don't to spare money, you, you cannot test yourself. I think it's better to take something to invest in, in some uh, cheaper products than uh, to do nothing. Um, the, Bake bicalin, it's a um, antiviral, and you know it's um, also um, inhibitor uh, has inhibitory activity against viruses. Um, HHV6 study is on the right side, Coxsackie virus again, so that makes therapy stronger. And nevertheless, don't underestimate this. We know, or I know, many of my or other patients internationally, they get herxheimer like reactions by that, and um, the one drop is enough for them so be careful if you use them they in some patients you need more we don't know why uh, but in in some patients uh, one drop is enough very sensitive to that but they react uh, this is a stevia now stevia is a sweetener uh, you could put it into your drinking water and it has also uh, antiviral activity um, please use the whole leaf extract um, you could also do a tea or whatever um, it's better to use this sweetener um, then if you use other sweeteners um, uh, you could also ask for chocolate um, there's no sugar in it with stevia it exists in the world this is also good if you change your nutrition that way a little inflammation we need to treat the inflammation so Today, I want to show you some, um, some possibility options, the Dendalian uh, Taracaxum officinale. This is um, native to Europe. So, um, and interestingly, when I went through this slide, it binds on the ACE receptor, and so it also can help you in SARS-CoV-2 infections to reduce um, the virus, uh, uh, the virus uh, replication phases. Um, and it also helps in liver problems, metabolic antioxidants. This is really important um, that um, it's uh, doing a support for the SOD, um, which also um, helps it's an enzyme that helps breaking uh, down the uh, dangerous oxygen molecules in the body cells and uh, glutathione you know glutathione is also very good for you in in your health to support this Netokinase, um, it got famous as a biofilm breaker. We have three biofilm breakers, the lumprokinase, the serapeptase, and natokinase. Uh, one of my favorites, my own favorites, natokinase. It's neuroprotective, proteolytic, and anti-inflammatory. And as I mentioned with the cytomegalovirus, all of these infections are doing coagulation problems. Um, so it's, it's not a bad thing if you would use uh, natokinase. Uh, maybe it's better to use aspirin, um, uh, but you need to drink maybe one of my key sentences, uh, three liters uh, water without gas. And if you don't do that, these biofilm breakers cannot work because biofilm is a slime, you spit it out, It's um, you need water, water, water in your body, and then you have a good chance also um, to roof the clots. And uh, maybe you could spare the money for uh, um, uh, aphorasis. Um, then uh, the lumpokinase got famous also in heart attacks when I was uh, intensive care doctor um, in the fibrinolysis. Uh, so the natokinase is really uh, a good option in this. Immune dysfunction detox. That's my last chapter now. Um, we have some binders to ensure efficient elimination. Chlorella, you all know. Um, 
the uh, inulin you heard about the zeolite is also very famous some don't tolerate it very well um, bentonite clay the activated charcoal can be dangerous be careful if you're using it aloe vera there are a lot of shops in the world now with that fulvic minerals also could help you um, and um, the portobello also is an option for you so there's a lot in the nature um, Nevertheless, if you have um, a tincture, use a tincture. If you don't have it, maybe in this case, you use a capsule. Berber and Pinella, this is my favorite, and detox, and uh, not just my, also for a lot of therapists I know in the world. Uh, Berber is um, um, a plant from South America, and uh, it's good for detox of the liver for sure, the kidneys and the lymphatic system, but, which is really important because, you know, the viruses, this, they block it. Uh, some have swollen lymph nodes as a symptom of that, and it supports also our immune system. Pinella, um, it's also from South America. It's aboriginal. Uh, remedies like TCM, um, and it's very effective also um, in eliminating biotoxins from brain, spinal cord. Um, so it's no guarantee that it's all doing that, but we have studies about that it uh, can do in your body. You need to try it out simply. It's also anti antibacterial, antifungal, anti fungal, and anti inflammatory. Magnesium malate, um, this is also very important to use because we get more uh, mitochondrial ATP, we need it. So use the malate because um, then you have a uh, option with a malic acid um, to bring it in a high level and to support uh, your ATP, your energy. Um, I, I would better use this as a capsule. Sorry about that. It's not a tincture, but um, if you go um, in internet, you will find options for you. Vitamin C. Vitamin C is crucial. We all know that if you don't live in Italy and you don't have enough lemons every day, it's so important. Uh, most powerful antioxidant, also in wound healing. Um, it stimulates our uh, blood cell immune activity. And you know, viruses, they suppress the leukocytes. And this is exactly what we need. We need to increase our leukocytes and the corticosteroids, they suppress also the leukocytes. So uh, this is not good for us. We need to increase vitamin C um, is really helpful. And um, it neutralizes free radicals also um, for your cardiovascular health. Um, and it helps you really, really, really. Uh, interesting, we lack the ability to synthesize it um, ourselves, uh, the vitamin C, along with only bats, guinea pigs, and other uh, arthropodic primates like monkeys. So we came from the monkeys, maybe. Um, vitamin D3, that's my last slide, and K2. MK7, the combination makes it more powerful. Um, I know a lot of products on the market for that. Um, they support a healthy immune system. It's good. Um, it became famous uh, during COVID crisis. There are a bigger working groups still ongoing with this combination, D3, um, and you need sunshine for that. Um, so go outside if it's not rainy. Joints, it's good for your, uh, if you have joints problems, muscle problems, blood pressure, and so on and so on. And it upregulates what's very important, um, the TH2 and uh, TH1 system. But um, please, if you're overregulated, be careful if you produce too much TH2 and you use it, you could also get an autoimmune disorder uh, by the TH17 pathway. So um, important, maybe you do a small panel with uh, CD19, CD3, CD6, maybe CD7, and then you know how is your immune system, TH1, TH2 balance, and then you could better adjust your therapy. Zinc, so that's my last slide now, is a key player in your... Or, all of us antiviral armory. Um, it uh, is a core factor in 300 different enzymes, and there are a lot of supplements around the world. But please, if you um, are not reacting allergic against this is a capsular, um, please use zinc. And now I'm coming to the end. Um, three eyes diagnostic and therapies. Um, this is what I want to give you on the way. Um, options. Don't give up if you suffer from ME and uh, you don't know uh, if a virus is doing that, like EBV, CMV. If you have little money, test for that. Um, if you cannot test, do something for your body, try it out. Um, you have options. And thank you very much for your intention. 
thank you very much, Armin. That was fantastic and amazing that you got through all of that. It was a very, you know, longer presentation, I think, than normal in 45 minutes. So we do still have time for some questions. And um, Amy said that she was only able to hear audio. She couldn't see the slides. Is there anywhere she can go for more information? I've just put a note into the chat that, um, yes, the recording as well as the slides will be made available on the AUNM website within a few days under past webinars. So I'm sorry about that, Amy. I don't know what happened there. Um, a question right at the beginning, I'll just go through sequentially, is um, can long-term use of valcyclovir, two grams a day, suppress the immune system? She says, as soon as I stop, even one day, a herpes cold sore immediately appears and breaks out. My body really struggles to fight it. I've had Lyme, Epstein-Barr virus, chickenpox, and COVID, and I'm also under extreme long-term stress. Do you have any um, opinion there and any sort of advice? Yeah, yeah. we have the similar situation with the long-term antibiotics we use in Lyme disease. You know, We know the viruses persist, and um, they... Uh, permanently triggered if you have a weak immune system, uh, but there are also the stressing factors. There's more in, in this story. You know, it's, it's not just uh, or a hormonal problem behind that uh, endocrinology. Maybe uh, the dopamine has a problem, adrenaline. So you need to check the hormones. You need to check TSH. Um, um, you need to check more. Um, you need to check the immune system. There's an underlying reason. Uh, it's not just to take a virus static and they say that's it. Um, it's Static, it helps you. It can reduce the viral load, but that's it. And you, um, you feel better for sure. But you cannot live your whole life. You get for sure some side effects after a while. If you please control in this case your liver enzymes, that's very important. If you use the virostatics. Thank you. Another question here um, from Scott. How often do you feel long COVID is actually viral persistence? Some suggest it's almost never viral persistence, and others say it is very commonly. Where do you sit on that spectrum? Mm, yeah, we... we um... We did not publish a case, but we, we saw a case uh, with a clinician in Augsburg. We saw a case uh, with swollen lymph nodes, and uh, the clinician did a biopsy. And the pathologist, uh, Dr. Stalin Wetzler, he did uh, PCR on that, and uh, he found still active uh, SARS-CoV-2 viruses in this lymph node. <laughs> so um, there are more studies published now, but single cases. You know, you, you need to do biopsies um, from lymphatic system as an example or from tissue uh, then you could uh, do a multiplex pcr and the best then to culture then you know if it's uh, but this uh, patient suffered from that um, persistent lymphatic swollen lymph node after uh, corona infection two years or so i think meanwhile and she's still taking valaciclovir so and it reduces the viral load the problem is not solved you know so um, it's still replicating the virus lymphotropic virus it uh, it likes that uh, valaciclovir cannot reach it so easily it's protected you know viruses are intelligent they don't want to be destroyed um, so um, they mutate maybe also with the so you, you cannot block them again in this case is always if you have a virus Virus persistence or suspicion, um, please check uh, for opportunistic viruses, reactivated viruses, or other reactivated pathogens uh, like parasites, yeast, mold, um, chlamydia, mycoplasma, maybe Borrelia can be reactivated, whatever. Um, get the complete picture from these infections you're suffering from, and then you can treat maybe with an antibiotic. Maybe the first patient has also some other chlamydia infection, and while a sickle is not enough, maybe she also needs then an antibacterial an antibiotic additionally to that uh, or something else to treat uh, uh, mycoplasma if it's reactivated. Uh, don't stuck um, in one-way street if you're not successful. Get please the complete picture and we have so, so much evidence now and we have this checklist also. Fill out the checklist then you know if, if something is active in post-COVID or not. You will see that. You will find the answer for sure. Oh, thank you. That's very helpful. One therapist here has a lot of patients with H. pylori, and she's asking, are there any infections that are linked uh, to stomach cancer apart from H. pylori? Yes, that's a very, very, very good question. We know um, that also cytomegalovirus 
can be implicated in this way because it's a colitis virus. Uh, it seems to be, and Coxsackie virus. We know that Coxsackie virus survives in, in the stomach, in biopsies. We have evidence based about that. Um, if she's interested, I, I did, uh, because I'm, I, I was oncologist myself, to be honest, I, I did chemotherapies with patients, not so successfully. Sorry about that. Um, but um, this time also, um, I learned a lot that we need um, to diagnose the correct viruses and uh, and the pathogens around that. So if you diagnose them, uh, you, you know a way and you don't need to do all the tests. Um, we come from the symptoms and then we select the test and uh, then we have answers or not. And then we could say, okay, treat this, this, this. And then you have uh, a good uh, chance also with cancer. And I did uh, also workshops in, in German, biological cancer groups and presentation. I have a panel also for different types of cancer. I, I could email uh, Suzanne that uh, panel of yes, tests. We, we don't have that on the website for yeah. obvious reasons, but we do have actually a couple of panels you put together for that. Um, what about Yersinia as a, an enterobacterium? Is that also something? That yes, can absolutely. Contribute? Yersinia camp campylobacter. Um, this is <laughs> very interesting too. Um, I have a good contact to the Crohn's and colitis group in America patients. And uh, we discussed that during crisis and because they got worse when they had COVID infections, um, they got reactivations. And then I said to them, okay, we do a panel for you. We test your patients for, with Crohn's and colitis uh, for uh, Yersinia, IgG, IgA. We test for Campylobacter. This has to do with pork, with eggs, and so um, IgG, IgA, and we test also for uh, cytomegalovirus with the ILI spot because we don't have IgA, um, and we test um, for the echovirus. These mm -hmm. four. <laughs> and you cannot imagine how many patients are suffering in this colitis and Crohn's group from one of these. Not not all of these, and then we can treat, and and many of them improved. Mm -hmm. Thank it's you. astonishingly mm -hmm. so uh, there is a reason behind not in all patients but it belongs to clarify to check and then to treat accordingly thank you um there's one um i think patient here who's mentioned um uh, quite a lot about his diagnosis so it would probably be too much to read out here and we don't really want in front of the entire group to go through um an entire patient case but um he does uh, say how very terrible it is that his uh, ME was uh, diagnosed as being primarily, you know, to be treated with cognitive behavioral therapy mm. and um, all of his uh, viral and um, bacterial tests were ignored and um, they just weren't taken seriously. And this is a problem that we have in the UK and I think probably in some parts of Germany as well. You know that any patients are terribly neglected but what i would like to suggest i won't mention your name but what i would suggest is that um you perhaps type in your um email and then we'll send you the practitioner list that we have and all of those practitioners that we will suggest to you are familiar with these tests and are very very willing to treat uh, based on what's been found and, and won't just sonotize it at all um Another yeah, but maybe I could, uh, Julia, yes, I could say mention. one yeah. sentence so that's um, fitting into the complexity. We haven't, we had, in, or we have in Germany the similar problems. Um, but this professor came to me from university. is a virologist. We don't have so many virologists in Germany. I think seven or eight, um, like Trosten on this level. And he said to me, "Oh, the the psychiatric doctor is coming to me, and um, and the neurologist is coming to me and asking me, how can I test now for cytomegalovirus my patient with neuropsychiatric symptoms? How can mm -hmm. I test them for herpes simplex for varicella?" And they find it. Mm -hmm. Also, universities are now on the way of that. Um, mm -hmm. Ignorance is one part, but if you ignore something like these doctors are doing, um, this is not good because you come into disadvantages. You know, others will make the pace. You know, um, so you will lose um, knowledge. You will you will lose uh, maybe patience. That doesn't make sense really, um, and it's evidence based. It's no hocus pocus. We are talking about of that. Course. Sorry, and that's the one you know small benefit i suppose of the last three to four years is that there has been so much research now 
into viruses and viral etiology that we didn't have before. Um, Alison asks, have you found um, whether far infrared sauna is a valuable treatment approach? Well, that's a really good question. We also in, in Lyme disease, we often discuss the infrared sauna. You could try it out. Right yeah, I, I believe there is a difference between the near and the far infrared. Near infrared can be very helpful. Exactly, it? exactly. Yeah. Um, try it out, and then you know. Yeah, yeah. But the question is, if you buy it, you know, you have an investment, and it doesn't work, and uh, or you get worse. Don't do it too long, please. Um, I spoke with Boris Kano a while ago, and we said in Lyme disease, if a patient is not recovering from antibiotics, one two months, think about what you're doing. Um, you you get more damages, you know, mm -hmm. all of this, you cannot repair the tissue, you know, if you have inf inflammation in your brain, in your joints, um, if it's Lyme disease, if it's a virus, whatever it is in the gut, please uh, think about other uh, different options and don't stuck into a one-way street in your therapy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, another question is, do you have a preferred source or supplier of Cemento and Vanderoff? Yes, I have it, but I don't want to do marketing action. They are sitting in Florida, in Jupiter. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I, I know this therapist, so I could probably let her know afterwards, but maybe she'll be able to, you know, uh, to, to work that out. Um, another question here is, how long should the herbal treatment last for long COVID? and reactivated viral infections. Is it possible to say that, or does it depend yes. on the code? Yes, if, if uh, as I mentioned, if in one, two, three months, nothing is happening. Herbs need longer than virostatics, okay? So virostatics should work one, two, three weeks. Hmm? This is hard, hard therapy, um, but um, the herbs, they need two, three months, and if it's helpful, six to nine months. Mm -hmm. um, there was originally the Cowden, I could uh, name that the Cowden protocol. Um, he, it was designed for nine months, uh, cycling around some herbs. So uh, nine months, I think it, it's good, but look, I'm taking it prophylactically, maybe my whole life and there's no damage. It's like chamomilla tea, <laughs> or curcuma I eat or whatever. Uh, so, um, so you should be treated so long, so long you're sick. So the symptoms are evident. And um, if you don't get healthy during that, you need to switch something. You need to change to add to rethink about your therapies. Don't stuck in this one way street with the herbs. Also, if it's successful um, nine months and then, and then I think it's good, but prophylactically, you cannot damage yourself. Thank you. Um, some suggest viruses are not real. You've probably seen this, um, you know, conversation cropping up now all over the internet. I, I um, this is uh, another very, very informed um, viewer here says, I, I've never, uh, some have never been isolated or it's said that they haven't been. My opinion is that viruses may be the most health negating organism family. And it seems that almost everyone with chronic illness has numerous viruses. Would you agree that they are more significant than we often consider? This is a, a good philosophic question. He says so viruses are proteins. So if they, you die, you have a protein, <laughs> nothing else. So, um, it's eliminated. Yeah, but I suppose what, what this question is uh, geared towards is are they becoming more um prolific are, are we encountering more viruses now or are we just no no no, no. it was before crisis uh, Jillian, before crisis already we saw a lot of ebv uh, infections in lyme disease patients we were exactly on that track exactly on that uh, with this early antigen lighting and we we went already away from antibiotics uh, to treat lyme patients okay because we saw there's a, a dead end uh, mm -hmm. for many of them. And long-term antibiotics uh, destroying the gut, 80% immunity is in the gut, not good for the patients. You need to think about that, what you're doing and nothing about the parasites and, and the yeast and mold, what's also, um, so we need to check off all of that. I, I think it's more, the consciousness is more, the, the immune system is worse now. We have a, a worse immune system, you know? Uh, we had this lockdown, we had neuropsychiatric stress, stressing factors. Um, our, our whole immunity 
actually is not so good. We were damaged. Um, the toxins, um, uh, the yeast mold stories, you know, everywhere we have no problems. Uh, our immune system, the stress that, that makes us crazy, that makes us immune suppressed. So the virus are more reactivated. We have more sick people. So young sick people, we have more cancer patients. We see also now more and more. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little unhappy because suddenly so many questions have come in and I can see we're not going to have time to answer them all. I'll just go through a few maybe from the back now rather than continuing to go down. Um, in the event of persistent spike and numerous reactivated viruses in long COVID, would the treatment approach then be to first try and address the reactivated viruses? Yes. Okay. And um, is B propolis useful for viruses, especially when you have a mouth manifestation? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you could use uh, also curcuma. Um, you could all, also use the ingwer. I don't know the, you, you know, ginger. better. Ginger. Ginger. ginger is also good for disinfection. It's burning. <laughs> if you have a high concentration of that, disinfection plays for surely a role. Uh, alcohol, also, if you put alcoholics on it. When I, when I had these blisters, I had years of this herb angina without knowing. I put always uh, alcohol on it, tinctures, chamomilla tinctures, and then they went away, but I didn't know that that was an infection, you know, mm -hmm. uh, ongoing, it's blisters in your mouth, they hurt. Mm -hmm. well, well, another question here from Gillian, what's the best biofilm buster? Yeah, there's not the best. Um, I, I would say my my favorite I like is the natokinase, um, also the serapeptase, and then is coming the lumprokinase, the old fashioned one. Yeah. So I, I would say the natokinase nowadays for me. Thank you. And does one have to take all the herbs recommended to see a good result? No. Um, you do it step by step. Um, the, um, the herbs, they complement each other. Um, you try it out if you have a reaction. If you don't have the reaction, you use the second additionally and then the third additionally. So maybe it's enough. I, I don't take so many herbs, to be honest. I take just Takuno Tunia every day. Um, prophylactically and against my Koksaki, the gut issues. Um, so this is um, not to do all of them, you know, um, but I know that um, the good therapists, they say, yeah, um, add them. It's better step by step, you know, how to tolerate them, how the Herx summer is with you, how you feel with that. But I would do a, a adding concept and not um, all together. You, you never know what where you're reacting now. Maybe you do some drops from this and then you mix it um, and then you see what's happening. And if it's not happening, you do the next one. You have options. That there are also therapists who are experienced with the um, protocols and also even the suppliers sure. who, who make the kinds of um, sure. you know, supplements that you've just discussed, the remedies, they also sure. have yeah. advisors. Um, I'll ask just one more question, and I do assure you we'll keep all the questions. And we have um, discussed that uh, Dr. Schwarzbach will be back to talk about the chapter in his book, Borrelia, that you've just seen. He did introduce that. It's uh, just come out. So he, he will be back again soon to talk about that. Um, so we'll include your questions there that we haven't addressed today. Um, one last one, perhaps, um, which is interesting, but I don't think you can probably answer it uh, immediately, or maybe you do have a solution. Sandra asks, can I get a list of what tests need to be considered in diagnosing various Viral viruses persistent with long COVID and vaccine-induced injuries. Is is that something where you would just say fill out the checklists or? or yes, absolutely, absolutely. Because as I mentioned, um, not every patient has problems with every virus, and it's better not to test all of them. <laughs> it's simply too expensive. I would do um, a selected uh, according to your symptoms. Uh, how many symptoms you have for this virus? How many symptoms for the for the other virus? And then you do a ranking. Very common is EBV for sure on the list. Uh, also the CMV, the Coxsackie always similar, but not all have HHV7, you know, we find HHV7, HHV8, HHV6, yeah. this depends, this depends. They're rare, aren't they? Yeah. 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 Okay, well, thank you so, so much for um, all your questions, and um, we will come back to those that haven't been answered. Uh, if you, you might even be able to answer um, in writing direct to you. Um, just to say that, um, first of all, thank you so, so much Dr. Schwarzbach again for that fantastic, uh, very, very 
informative talk today. And um, I'd just like to mention that we do have a webinar planned on the um, 24th of April. Uh, it, it's uh, a repeat um, with a wonderful doctor who you met uh, recently called Dr. Nancy O'Hara. And she'll be talking again about um, the complexities of pans and pandas um, with uh, you know further deeper discussion about uh, the latest research and also therapies for these um, autoimmune brain um, conditions. And um, she'll also be answering questions from the last time. Um, and she's given us a nice long session. So please put aside as much time as you can for that. It'll begin at nine sorry, at 7.15 on the 24th of April, which is a Wednesday. So um, I'll just give you the link for that, though it's up already under our events button on the website. It's aonm.org slash D-R-O-H-A-R-A. So that's D-R-O and then H-A-R-A. -A. So um, Dr. Schwarzbach, thank you so, so much. Fantastic. I know we'll have you again very soon. And um, any last words you'd like to just finish with? Don't fear the viruses. We have options and stay healthy. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for being there as well. And see you again soon. Somebody, again, who might have joined late asked, um, will there be a way to get hold of the slides? Yes, absolutely. They'll be up under the past webinars tab um, in a few days, as well as the recording. Thank you very much. Bye.